Joining me now is Michael McFall, former U.S. ambassador to Russia and MSNBC international affairs analyst, and Charlie Sykes, MSNBC contributor and columnist. Thank you both for being here, gentlemen. I do want to start with you, Michael McFall, Ambassador McFall. Um, I, you know, I guess because I just finished writing a book about Medgar Evers and Merle Evers Williams, it's just on my mind this idea of, of courage in the face of what is n near certain death. Uh, people who stay or go into a place where they know that they are physically at risk because of their love of country, love of their family, just love of, 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 of good things, of, of good and of right. Uh, Alexei Navalny um, went into Russia knowing he would likely be arrested, knowing he would likely be killed. He is that kind of figure. What do you make of how alone he sort of is in terms of American conservatives? who I think a generation ago would have been lauding him um, in his sacrifice, but today are largely silent. And tell us, what was he like? What was he like as a person? Well, Joy, to your first question, I'm glad you brought up those historical examples. That's exactly the kind of person we should be comparing Alexei Navalny to. Um, and you're right. He knew the risks. I was talking to him right before he went back, corresponding with him. He knew exactly the risk you're talking about. The greatest burden he had, to be honest, was not about himself, but about being the absent father and about being the absent husband that that he knew was likely to happen and the burden on his family. It was not about his own fate. Um, uh, and tragically, that burden has become even greater, though, as you noted, Yulia has already decided, Yulia Navalny, that she is going to play the role of leading this movement. Uh, doesn't surprise me in the least, uh, and she is a very strong, competent, capable person to do so. It's just tragic she has to do so under these circumstances. You know, with respect to Alexei, it's a big question you asked your second one. I, I would just say a couple of things. You know, I knew him for a long time, but because of politics, like when I was ambassador, we never met once because it was bad for his political career. Uh, he, we would joke about it, and we ran into each other one time at a anniversary meeting for the Moscow Times, but he didn't want to be accused of being a puppet of the United States. Uh, after I got out of the government, I became closer to his family because his daughter goes to school here at Stanford. I just saw Yulia the night before uh, Alexei was killed uh, in Munich. I saw her, talked to her the day after and saw her. Um, and getting to know them, I would say this is a world historic figure. I, I don't, you don't get a chance to meet many of them in life. And I have in my time in life. I also write about them because I write about democracy movements and I teach courses on democratization. He is one of those figures. He had the intelligence. He had the charisma. Extremely funny. He was extremely principled uh, and courageous. And he knew that, that his ideas were better than Putin's ideas. And yes, dictators can kill individuals, but they can't kill ideas. And I'm confident in predicting, I don't know when, but I'm confident in predicting his ideas will prevail over Putin's ideas in the long run. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, uh, it was Meg Rivers who said, you can kill a man, but you cannot kill an idea. And uh, I think that he actually embodies that exact same thing, uh, Alexei Navalny. Um, let me go to you, Charlie Sykes, because Donald Trump it, it had the nerve. Um, and it is, it is pretty, uh, it takes a lot of nerve to compare yourself to Alexei Navalny, who sacrificed his life for his country because he has a patriot of his country. Donald Trump tried to overthrow the government of his country. Um, he might do better to compare himself to Putin um, when he himself has argued through his lawyers that he has the authority and right as president to use SEAL Team 6 to kill his political opponents. Putin just used a prison to kill his political opponents, allegedly. You have, you know, people that he praises, like Viktor Orban. That's who he, uh, mm -hmm. who he respects. People like Xi Jinping uh, in China. People like um, Kim Jong-un in North Korea. That's who he respects. How dare he compare himself? Vic Javier Millet, um, who wants to invade Guyana to steal their oil. Those are his friends. That's who he likes. What do you make of the fact that he dared to compare himself to somebody who martyred himself, was a martyr for the betterment of Russia? Well, it was obscene. Um, you know, as the ambassador pointed out, uh, you know, Alexei Navalny represented uh, two things very starkly. I think last week, number one was what real genuine courage looked like. And uh, two, um, 
highlighted the the existence of evil um, in in Russia today, and that Vladimir Putin represents not just an authoritarian force, um, but he is a murderer, a murderer who has been defended and befriended by Donald Trump. So when Liz Cheney talked about the Putin wing of the Republican Party, she's talking about uh, something that has flowed directly from its leader, Donald Trump. And how obscene is it that Donald Trump spends so many days unable to even mention Navalny's name while he was hawking tacky gold $400 sneakers? Um, this is just another reminder of the absolute moral bankruptcy um, that was described in uh, Jonathan Carl's book, where you have um, this, this, this world leader uh, who has been martyred, uh, murdered by Vladimir Putin. And all Donald Trump can think about is how can he make it about himself? How can he cast himself as a victim? How can he associate himself with a man of this kind of courage and vision? which he utterly and completely lacks. One of the things about Donald Trump is his inability to recognize the heroism of others, the courage of others. He can't recognize it in John McCain. He cannot recognize it in Navalny. So what he needs to do is to tear it down and make it all about himself. This was one of those moments where I think if, if we were not aware of the stakes of this year's elections, that, that it does involve uh, the Putin wing of the Republican Party possibly getting back into the White House. The events of the last several days, I think, uh, have highlighted that in really stark and dramatic terms. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just correct myself. Uh, Millet is of Argentina, the one who is like Trump. Uh, I think they're doing abortion bans and such. It's Venezuela that wants to invade uh, Guyana. It's hard to keep all the dictators straight. To go back to you, Ambassador McFall, the Republicans seem very reluctant to help um, Ukraine defeat Russia. And, you know, like the old Soviet Union that um, uh, Putin would like to put back together, degrading their military via Ukraine without a single U.S. soldier having to lose their lives, you would think would be agreed upon by everyone to be good for U.S. national security, right? Russia can't beat Ukraine outright. They need uh, uh, us to help Ukraine lose. And it seems like Republicans want to help Ukraine lose. What do you make of that? And do you think that uh, Navalny's death might change some of their minds and make them stand up to Putin. Well, first, thanks to both of you for using the word evil. That is right. Putin is evil, and this is a fight between good and evil uh, with large, large consequences. If Putin prevails in Ukraine, I just got back from the Munich Security Conference meeting with lots of leaders from the eastern part of our alliance, and let me tell you, uh, it's the, the, the specter of the 1930s was hanging over all those conversations, because first it's Ukraine, then it's Lithuania, then it's Poland, and it was, Michael, Americans, wake up. Do not repeat this history again, those isolationist tendencies, the Lindberghs of the world saying, putting their heads in the sand. They look foolish. They look, uh, it, just go back and read them. Don't be that, Speaker Johnson. That's your fate if you don't take this action now. And the second thing I would say, uh, you know, in fights against good and evil, it's hard when you're far away. What can you do? You feel helpless. I know Yulia and people around here. How, what are they supposed to do against this evil person, Vladimir Putin, the day after, you know, just days after uh, he killed her husband? But members of Congress have it right in their hands. It's a piece of legislation that's already passed in the Senate. They can come back from their holiday and be on the right side of history and do good against evil. They don't have to do anything. And I met some of those members of Congress in Munich, and it's striking to me how nobody argues against me when I say that. They're just worried about Mr. Trump. And, and yeah. I just think you have to sometimes do what's right and worry about the consequences later, and they have this moment. So I just plead with Speaker Johnson, do the righteous thing. You don't get a chance in life very often to do the righteous thing. If you're voted out of a speaker you know, we, a few weeks later, at least you had your shot to do something good. This is their shot. They need to do it now. Do it for the warriors in Ukraine and do it for Yulia Navalny and all of the supporters of Alexei Navalny. Um, instead of that, Charlie Sykes, here was the reaction from J.D. Vance, 
quote, we know why Navalny died, because we know Putin is a brutal guy. But I know Putin was a brutal guy. I knew Putin was a brutal guy a year ago, and I know he'll be a brutal guy a year from now. Mike Johnson, as Congress debates the best path forward in the support of Ukraine, the United States and our partners must be using every means available to cut off Putin's ability to fund his unprovoked war in Ukraine and aggression against um, the Baltic states. But he doesn't want to actually pass the bill that would do that. You have Dinesh D'Souza, who's always got to weigh in. Navalny equals Trump. The plan of the Biden regime and the Democrats is to ensure their leading political opponent dies in prison. There's no difference between the two cases. That's what we've got from Republicans, Charlie. Well, to Dinesh's point, I mean, that is just complete toxic BS. Um, I'm, I'm editing myself there. But um, as the ambassador said, look, uh, Mike Johnson has a chance to actually answer Vladimir Putin back. He has the piece of legislation in his hand. He he is holding back on it because, number one, he is, unlike uh, Navalny, he is a political coward so far. Uh, an overwhelming majority of members of the House would vote for that legislation. So he is blocking it because he is afraid of Donald Trump. He's afraid of losing his job. He's not afraid of being thrown into prison. He's afraid of going on to the, <laughs> the ash heap where other, look, he, he's not going to stay speaker for very long anyway. Yeah. So he's got to ask himself, how does he want to be remembered? What is important to him? What are, what are the values yeah. that he is willing to sacrifice for? And so far, it is nothing. But again, it is, it is a very stark moment. By the way, speaking of political cowardice, J.D. Vance yeah. um, refused to even meet with the Ukrainian president. Uh, Zelensky, because he did not even yeah. want to be in the same room with him. He did not want to look him in the eye. So we have more cowardice Trump doesn't on top like of it. Cow. Absolutely. Right. And this is a seven in 10 position. 70 plus percent of Americans want this done. Uh, Michael McFall, Charlie Sykes. Thank you both.